uh, is with great joy um, and personal satisfaction as well that I welcome um, Catherine Edwards uh, from Birkbeck here this evening to give the annual BSR Institute for Classical Studies um, lecture. Uh, this is a kind of bilateral uh, arrangement whereby next week we'll be having a lecture uh, with Greg Wolfe chairing um, at the Institute of Classical Studies in London given by the director of the Parque Archaeological from Paestum. Um, and hopefully this is the kind of instance of increasing bilateral uh, Italian-UK cooperation across HEIs, um, which we're trying to push for as part of the UK-Italy um, cultural season that we're running annually now in conjunction with the um, uh, embassies and with the British Council and um, with the other members of the so-called British family in Italy. Uh, so it's, I'm really pleased that, that Catherine can be here uh, this evening. Um, Catherine was made Professor of, of Classics and Ancient History at Birkbeck in 2006, um, having come to Birkbeck from the University of Bristol, where we were fellow colleagues, albeit in different departments, um, for many years as youth, or relatively youthful, anyway, at that stage. Um, we were very young. <laughs> we were very good, though. It was a very good setup. Um, and it was during that period at Bristol that you know, Catherine led a, a really interesting, uh, and I remember the uh, opening in the Bristol Museum, uh, Leverhulme, three-year Leverhulme project on receptions of Rome in the 19th and 20th centuries, which at the time was very innovative in terms of the way in which it combined what is now taken as almost a kind of requirement of interdisciplinary research grants, which is involving the, the, the kind of library museum sector in academic um, uh, work in terms of uh, uh, community engagement, that whole agenda of kind of reaching out and thinking about the impact and the visibility of research um, beyond the publications of uh, learned articles and, and monographs. Um, Catherine works on Roman cultural history um, and Latin prose literature, particularly on the younger Seneca, um, as well as having interests in the classical reception and, and classical antiquity in later periods, so in the kind of long, long durée. Um, more recently, Catherine has been um, president of the Society for the Promotion of Roman Studies, um, which mantle I think you've just passed on uh, after three years of service, um, has played an important role um, within classics nationally, having served on ref panels um, in the past uh, for classics, and is also, and you might know her from this, a regular contributor uh, to Radio 4's In Our Time series. Um, there was one episode, I think, on Agrippina the Younger, uh, Cleopatra, Roman Britain, something of a regular, so obviously Melvin uh, approves of your uh, work. Um, publications are too numerous to mention. I often put them on my reading lists for my Renaissance comedy courses in terms of the work done on Roman comedy uh, and the new comedy of the classical tradition. Um, and we're absolutely delighted that she's come today to speak on Visions of Ruin, Volney's Les Ruines and Mary Shelley's Rome. And we're delighted that tomorrow, beginning, we have one of the days of the two-day Keith Shelley conference being hosted at the BSR. Um, and it's lovely to have Giuseppe here, the curator of the Keith Shelley House in Rome. So very much uh, a family affair. And we hope that you enjoy the lecture and thank Catherine ahead of time uh, for coming over and being with us this evening. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Stephen, for that very generous introduction. It's a great honor to be invited to give this um, BSR ICS uh, annual lecture here in Rome. It's a delight to be back in the British School of Rome, um, a place I've spent much time in over many years, and uh, I know what a very special place it is. So, visions of ruin. Um, in Mary Shelley's phenomenal novel, Frankenstein's Monster, a mashup of the noble savage and Mr. Hyde, to bring in a somewhat anachronistic point of reference, having run away from his creator, takes refuge in the countryside. Gradually, he acquires some knowledge of human culture and history through his prolonged observation of a small family in an isolated cottage in the Swiss mountains. The elderly father and his son and daughter receive an exotic guest, a Turkish woman who knows very little French. The son, Felix, who is in love with the beautiful visitor, Safi, embarks on a course of instruction to help her understand his language and Western culture more generally. The first book he chooses to expound is a study published in 1791, Les Ruines ou Méditations sur les Révolutions des Empires, whose author, Constantin François de Chasseboeuf, went by the pen name Volney. 
Um, and oh, got so many. There he is. Good. Um, I think the name is a, a homage to Voltaire and um, his estate, Fernet, as a sort of amalgamation of the two. My focus today is in part on Volney's brief but extraordinarily influential book, published at the height of the French Revolution in 1791 and dedicated to the National Assembly, of which Volney was a member, which offers a, a sweeping vision of human history, in particular of humanity's capacity for self-destruction and the potentially redemptive power of reason. Little read now, Volney enjoyed such a vogue in the late 18th and early 19th century Britain that Marilyn Butler termed him the Foucault of his day. I want to explore the place of Rome in this book and to interrogate the book's role in the history of receptions of Rome and Rome's ruins, focusing particularly on the writings of Mary Shelley. Volney's Ruins, as I noted, was first published in 1791. Its immediate popularity may be gauged from the fact that the French text was reprinted five times um, before 1820, um, and within a year of its first appearance, it was translated into English. Um, the translator in 1792 was James Marshall, um, who was, uh, we might note, a good friend of William Godwin, Mary Shelley's father. Two competing translations were soon in circulation, one with a preface by Thomas Jefferson, who'd become friends with Volney during his years in Paris. In the period up to 1840, 11 editions of the ruins in English were produced. Burt's popularity and prestige, particularly among radicals, is well attested. Why did Volney's work strike such a chord? For many, it served, in the words of one recent scholar, as the most eloquent defense of the French Revolution available. But my focus is not so much on the politics, but rather the poetics of Les Ruines, especially as they inform responses to actual ruins. Volney's opening invocation is addressed to ruins and to tombs. And he exclaims, what useful lessons, and I think this is on your handout, what useful lessons, what affecting and profound reflections you suggest to him who knows how to consult you. When the whole earth in chains and silence bowed the neck before its tyrants, you had already proclaimed the truths um, which they abhor and confounding the dust of the king with that of the nearest slave, had announced to man the sacred dogma of equality. Following the invocation, L'Héroïne takes as its more specific point of departure the ruins of Palmyra in the Syrian desert. The narrator describes his journey there in 1784, part of an extended tour of the regions of Syria and Egypt, during which he has often been given pause to reflect uh, by the sight of ruined palaces and temples. Finding himself in Homs, he resolves to make the difficult trip across the desert to see for himself the ruins of the fabled Palmyra. This is presented as a voyage through a wasteland, crossing solitary deserts, a valley of caves and sepulchres, and after three or four days he comes upon um, a scene of the most stupendous ruins. He receives hospitality from some Arabs whose huts are constructed amid the remains of the Temple of Sol and decides to stay a few days to explore the ruins. One evening, he takes a walk in the Valley of the Tombs, eventually stopping at an elevated point with views over the ruins and the surrounding desert, where he sits on a fallen column and abandons himself to reverie. As dusk falls, silence reigns. Contrasting in vivid terms the busy commerce, the grand structures which once prevailed, with the current state of desolate ruin, he reflects in his second chapter on what made this wealthy city a key center of trade as it was, and other great cities like it, collapse. How do such dreadful transformations come about? He speculates on the role of religion. Then his thoughts turn back to France, and he reflects on the parallel between the flourishing of modern Europe and of the ancient Near East. Would modern Europe, too, fall into ruin one day? The narrator weeps at the thought and is plunged into melancholy. Then, amid the ruins, a ghostly figure appears. The genie, or spirit of the tombs and ruins, makes clear the cause of the ruin is not a divine curse, but rather human failure, specifically the operation of the passions and of ignorance. If thy heart can comprehend the language of reason, interrogate these ruins. A melding of reason and feeling is needed for this process. The narrator puts to the genie his questions. By way of response, the genie offers the narrator the opportunity to view human affairs from an altogether new perspective, whisking him up into the ether 
From this sublime viewpoint, the Earth resembles the moon as it appears from the Earth's surface. Enhancing the narrator's powers of vision, the genie points out to him many features, including the ruins of ancient Thebes in Egypt, ces points gris sont les pyramides, these grey points of the pyramid, the sites of Tyre and of Sidon, Persepolis, Ecbatana, and Palmyra. The sight of these ruins is to serve as a lesson from history. The visionary quality of this overview is less evident in the chapters which follow, although these too are words put in the mouth of the genie. Volney has the genie focused particularly on the dangers posed by organized religion, which so often prevents the exploited from revolting. Almost half the book is concerned with the origins and history of different religions, stressing their common characteristics. A vision of the French Revolution, presented as a future event, if we remember that the trip is set in 1784, serves as the book's culmination. Much of the book is then devoted to the celebration of the rule of law. Um, Volney was uh, not altogether happy with the course the French Revolution subsequently took. L'Héroïne includes a frontispiece, there we are, um, which is, I think, very suggestive, um, engraved by Pietro Martini. Um, uh, here we see a kind of capriccio of Palmyrene ruins, um, and looking out over them, seated beneath a palm tree on a hill amid archaeological fragments, is a figure in oriental dress, whom we might be tempted to identify as the author. The image, as Jonas Siebel underlines, almost certainly draws on the illustrations in Robert Wood and James Dawkins' celebrated 1753 volume, um, the ruins of Palmyra. Um, there's one image from there and another. Now, Volnay himself, it should be noted, had not, in fact, ever visited Palmyra. Though he did have a first-hand report of it from the artist Louis-François Cassard, um, with whom he traveled in 1785. But Wood's volume of 1753 had given the name of Palmyra a very particular moral, political, and aesthetic resonance in the Western world. Um, here's uh, Gavin Hamilton's image of Dawkins and Wood discovering the ruins of Palmyra. Obviously, no one else had seen them before, apart from <clears throat> all the other people who lived there. But, um, we, I mean, I think Hamilton's interesting. He also gives us grand tourists. Uh, we had... Um, wooden Dawkins in their togas, obviously latter-day Romans, although civilian rather than military Romans. Um, and then here we have uh, their modern-day descendants in Rome itself. Um, the, the, uh, this, this kind of romanticization of Palmyra is to be noticed, uh, I think, across a wide range of literature in this period. Um, in the French Encyclopédie, for instance, the article on ruins by Jocourt pays particular attention to the majestic remains of Palmyra, so they become a kind of byword for ruined cities. And this resonance helps explain, I think, why it was that Volney chose Palmyra over the wet, less well-known places he had actually visited um, as the scene from which to begin his visionary work. For Volney himself was no armchair traveler. In 1783 to 5, he'd spent an extended period traveling in the east, passing many months in Egypt and in Syria, even if he never made it all the way to Palmyra itself. And he includes, um, uh, sorry, some Pyrenees, which I haven't got time for, but um, this is uh, his, his account of his travels, and uh, this is an earlier publication than um, the ruins. Um, he includes in his account of his own travels a description based on that of Wood, as he makes clear at the time, um, giving a summary of Wood's journey, kind of included within his own account. Um, and this volume appeared in 1787, um, and from it we glean quite a lot about the experiences of Volney, who is a very accomplished linguist. Um, he read Greek and Hebrew. Learned some, having learned some Arabic in Paris, became fluent in the course of his travels. Whether or not he was secretly working for the French government remains unclear, but certainly Napoleon made extensive use of Volney's writings on Egypt when he undertook his neo-Roman campaign of conquest there a few years later. The opening of Volney's ruin has a certain affinity, I think, with another scene of literary conception published just a couple of years earlier in 1788 out of Edward Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, whose final chapter circles back to the city of Rome itself. Gibbon recalls how the idea of writing the decline and fall first came to his mind as he sat among the ruins on the Capitol at dusk one autumn evening. 
Certainly, Gibbon had visited Rome in person back in 1764, but the scene is, as numerous scholars have underlined, highly mythologized. Indeed, Gibbon's ruins are themselves imaginary, since by the time he visited Rome, the Capitoline Hill was dominated rather by Michelangelo's piazza. Had Volney read Gibbon? Gibbon and Volney, we might note, both frequented the Salon of Baron d'Olbach in Paris, and the first and second volumes of the French translation of Gibbon's Decline and Fall um, had just been published when um, Gibbon visited Paris in 1777, uh, so they were very much around. Um, but it, I think the in one interesting parallel between them is that they both argue for a strong connection between the degradation of civic virtue and the decline of empire. And in both cases, a vision of ruin concretizes that argument, even if this, this is, for Gibbon, perhaps only implicit, that every powerful empire will one day bite the dust. Gibbon, Gibbon himself was certainly familiar with Wood's account of Palmyra, incidentally, which he refers to in one of his footnotes. But the poetics of Volney's study operate rather differently, I think. The temporalities in Gibbon and in Volney are both complex, but only Volney muses explicitly on scenes of future ruin. He imagines in chapter two, as I noted earlier, some time when a visitor from a distant continent would meditate on fallen civilizations while musing beside the Seine, the Thames, or the Zuyder Zee. Um, and again, this is on your handout. Reflecting that such had once been the activity of the places I was then contemplating, who knows, said I, but such may one day be the abandonment of our countries. Who knows if on the banks of the Seine, the Thames, the Zuyder Zee, where now in the tumult of so many enjoyments, the heart and the eye suffice not for the multitude of sensations, who knows if some traveler like myself shall not one day sit on their silent ruins and weep in solitude over the ashes of their inhabitants and the memory of their former greatness. Um, there's a, the influence of, of Denis Diderot has been, I think, traced here by Roland Mortier, uh, who underlines um, the, the influence of uh, Diderot's reviews of, of paintings of this time. Um, in the Salon of 1767, um, Diderot is responding to the paintings of um, Hubert Robert, whose extensive oeuvre repeatedly reimagined scenes of ruin um, Diderot describes his image of, the, um, of a great gallery illuminated um, from the end. Oh, this is, and this is a, um, ruins of a Roman bath with washerwomen. Um, <coughs> Hubert Robert has a lot of, of, of these scenes of, of ruin juxtaposed with people going about their, their daily life um, in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of um, juxtaposition of, of temporalities. But, um, and later on, he would go on to produce, for instance, this uh, image of the recently founded Louvre Museum, full of antiquities removed from Rome, but this here reduced to itself to a ruin like the ruins of Rome. This is an image from 1796, so post-dating um, Volney. Um, uh, was a, uh, marked as a, explicitly as an exhilaratingly ominous scene of future ruin, perhaps something all too easily imagined amid the wrecked buildings of revolutionary Paris. Percy Bysshe Shelley's satirical preface to Peter Bell III, invoking a similar motif uh, written in 1819, suggests that such scenes had already become something of a commonplace. There's a real vogue for this kind of... Uh, imaginings of future ruination. <coughs> Volney had not visited Palmyra, but the prospect of future ruins in Volney's 1791 book does pick up on the final section of the earlier account of his travels, the voyage of 1787, so two years before the French Revolution. Here he comments, these cities of Asia were once wealthy and flourishing, but who can assure us that the states of Europe will not one day experience the same reverse? Let us suppose that at the time when Egypt and Syria were at the summit of their glory, some had delineated to the people and governments of those countries their present deplorable state. Is it not probable that those governments would have taken care to avoid those fatal mistakes which must conduct them to utter destruction? Volney's biographer, Gomier, reads Palmyra in ruins here, or rather, in fact, these are the, the other cities in addition to Palmyra, as modeling for Versailles under threat from looming revolution. The palace's royal inhabitants would have done well, it is implied, to take a lesson from the history of the Near East. <laughs> 
Mary Shelley's husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, certainly read Volney and was significantly influenced by his work. Echoes of Volney's writings have been traced in Queen Mab of 1812-13, in Alastor of 1815, and in Ozymandias of 1818. Volney's first English translator was a friend of Mary Shelley's father, William Godwin, we might recall. Volney's book plays a significant role, as we know, saw earlier, in the education of Frankenstein's monster. Um, while Le Ruin does not actually figure in Mary Shelley's reading list, which has been assembled from the journals she kept rather intermittently, the list is by no means comprehensive, and we can, I think, assume that she knew the book really quite well. Yet Mary's characterization of the contents of Volney's Le Ruin in her novel Frankenstein is in certain respects rather surprising. Describing his experiences, Frankenstein's monster records how Volney's book whose exposition he overhears, gave him a revealing education. This is on your handout. Through this work, I obtained a cursory knowledge of history and a view of the several empires at present existing in the world. It gave me an insight into the manners, governments, and religions of the different nations of the earth. I heard of the slothful Asiatics, of the stupendous genius and mental activity of the Grecians, of the wars and wonderful virtue of the early Romans, of their subsequent degenerating, of the decline of that mighty empire, chivalry, Christianity, and kings. I heard of the discovery of the American hemisphere and wept with Safi, who's the primary audience of this reading, over the hapless fate of its original inhabitants. All this visionary work affects a decisive change in the mood of Frankenstein's monster, filling a creature whose character was originally innocent and good-hearted with contradictory sentiments. Several different ancient civilizations are mentioned in his summary of the book, but I shall focus for the rest of my talk, perhaps unsurprisingly, on the Romans. Having myself been prompted to return to Volney by Frankenstein's monster, I raced through Les Ruines to see just what Volney had to say about Rome. The monster comments on his own impression of the ruins, as I've just noted. I heard of the wars and wonderful virtue of the early Romans, of their subsequent degenerating, of the decline of that mighty empire. But the monster's interpretation of Volney turns out to be decidedly idiosyncratic. As I read through the ruins, I was more and more puzzled. I could find virtually no reference to ancient Rome, aside from a small handful of footnotes. In one, for instance, Volney typically observes, such a quick passage from their republican despotism to their profound civility under the emperors was made clear that they were not worth imitating. Rome very occasionally features as a point of comparison. It has been calculated, writes Volney, that Caesar made three million men perish. It would be interesting to make the same calculation with every founder of religion. But in Volney's grand scheme, Rome receives very little explicit attention. Indeed, leaving aside the arresting and highly influential opening sections, ruins themselves, notwithstanding the work's title, play a surprisingly minor part in Volney's study. So was Mary Shelley simply mistaken in the way she had the monster characterize this book? I think we could see her as a rather more careful reader of Volney than she might at first seem. Elsewhere, Volney himself had written on aspects of ancient Roman history. Indeed, Mary Shelley may well have drawn on Volney's writings more generally for the monster's summary of Les Ruines. But I'd like to argue that Rome, though occluded, is a more insistent presence in Volney's most influential work than a first reading might suggest. I've got a, a very Roman... Volney here. What could the monster have learned of Rome from this book? Although Mary Shelley's character Felix is described as choosing Volney's ruins as suitable for his visitor on the grounds that the declamatory style was framed in imitation of the Eastern authors, modern critics have seen little trace of Eastern influence in, Vol in, in Volney's writing style, though it certainly resonates with the fashion for orientalizing locations, also evident as we've seen in Jokur's entry in the, on, on ruins in the encyclopedia. Um, as well as fiction, such as um, William Beckford's Vathek, for instance. Much more conspicuous is the critique of moral decline, particularly the corrosive power of luxury and avarice associated with empire in terms which seem to somebody who spends a lot of time reading Roman authors, strikingly familiar. 
Key facets of Volney's explanatory model are to be found in the writings of Roman historians like Sallust and recur in philosophical analyses such as those of the younger Seneca. In particular, Volney takes the view that luxury was a major cause of the decline both of Rome and of feudal states. One might argue that such rhetoric had simply become a standard feature of Enlightenment discourse, but I think there are some um, more specific parallels. Let us consider the opening scene in which the genie sweeps the narrator up into the ether from which they look down on the turbulent comings and goings of humanity. This is, of course, a venerable literary trope, but the scene bears a notable resemblance to an exceptionally well-known passage in Cicero's treatise at De Republica on the Republic. This is the dream of Scipio, who's visited by his dead grandfather. The younger Scipio, in Cicero's dialogue, is made to describe his thoughts as in his dream he gazes down. Indeed, the earth itself seemed to me so small that I was scornful of our empire, which covers only a tiny point, as it were, upon its surface. While this scene might at first suggest disparagement of the Roman Empire, the character of the younger Scipio is being helped to understand how one might achieve celestial destiny through winning true glory. So he's being inspired to serve Rome's earthly kingdom better, a rather different sort of agenda from Volney's. Um, an additional perspective, I think, on this episode in Cicero is offered by a text written a century or so later, and itself almost certainly known to Volney, um, the by the Stoic philosopher Seneca, uh, whose writings um, were much read in intellectual circles in late 18th century Paris. Um, Seneca reworks Cicero's scenes to rather different ends in his natural questions. Um, while Rome itself is barely mentioned in this text, Seneca's repeated assertions that all empires eventually come to an end by implication at least, include Rome. Um, but the philosopher argues that no empire is of importance, um, and the preface to but one of the natural questions um, includes the, the following observation, which I've put on the handout. The mind cannot despise colonnades, panelled ceilings gleaming with ivory, trimmed shrubbery, and streams made to approach mansions until it goes round the entire universe and looking down upon the earth from above an earth limited and covered mostly by sea, while even the part out of the sea is squalid or parched or frozen, says to itself, is this that pinpoint which is divided by sword and fire among so many nations? Seneca's argument in this book is that once we've studied the whole universe, we shall despise not only luxury, but also the trappings of earthly power. Only philosophy matters. Seneca's vision is much more geographically specific than that of Cicero. Um, he goes on to talk about the particular border regions of the Roman Empire, though ultimately the defense of the edges of that empire is a matter of insignificance. Um, it's worth remembering that although Volney's formal university studies comprised first law and then medicine, his early years at school in Angers had been focused entirely on Latin. And in later years, he made ample use of the library of Baron d'Olbach who had a particular interest in Roman philosophy. Um, Baron Dolbach, whose championing of atheism in a strongly stoic vein seems to have influenced Volney um, significantly, had commissioned translations into French um, of Seneca's works in the 1770s. And um, also closely associated with his circle was um, Denis Diderot, who composed two essays defending Seneca's moral philosophy and was also the author of the entry on stoicism in the Encyclopédie. So I think it's, um, there are good grounds for seeing significant stoic influence on, on Volney. <laughs> Volney's purpose in Lyrian was significantly different from that of Cicero, and indeed that of Seneca, but we may, I think, trace a strong stoicizing element in his conception of uh, the need to tame the passions and to foster reason. Volney blames religion for exploiting the passions of hope and fear, for focusing humanity's attention on an alternative fatherland in the hereafter so that they are more accepting of the privations they suffer. Crucial to his case is the role of reason, but also that of nature, an absolutely central term in Stoicism. Rome, I would like to argue, is thus not so absent from Volney's ruins as might at first seem. Rather, Rome could be read as a pervasive presence in this book, in that Roman historical and philosophical writing suffuses Volney's characterization of the development of human society. On one level, then, Frankenstein's monster shows himself a very perceptive reader of Volney's work. When Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, which famously had its origin in a competitive story, uh, ghost story writing uh, during the dismal summer of 1816 in Switzerland, she had not yet visited Rome herself. The Shelleys arrived there late in 1818, in November. 
Borrowing a phrase from Germaine de Stael, whose novel Corinne, set largely in Rome, both Shelley's read during their time there, Percy Bysshe Shelley called Rome a city of the dead. The deathliness of Rome for the Shelleys would take on a heart-wrenchingly personal dimension. They had already lost one child traveling in northern Italy. Clara died in Venice in September 1818, and their son William would die in Rome in June 1819. And of course, Shelley himself, who drowned off the Italian coast, was, like his son, buried in the non-Catholic cemetery um, by the Pyramid of Cestius. This is, oh, that's Mary Shelley. Um, and there is the grave of Shelley um, by Walter Crane, now in the Ashmolean. It's hard not to see Mary Shelley's personal experience of loss as informing aspects of her work. Yet, as recent critics have noted, biographism, interpreting her writing primarily in terms of her personal experiences, can too easily prompt neglect of other dimensions of her work. Mary Shelley's later writing returns on a number of occasions to themes associated with Volney. I shall look particularly at a short, indeed unfinished piece, which survives in two fragments, probably written in 1819 after her son William's death, entitled Valerius, the Reanimated Roman, and also at the final part of Mary's lengthy novel of 1826, The Last Man. Valerius, apparently set in Mary's present, centers on an individual who's been brought back to life through means which are not made explicit 1,900 years after his death. In the first fragment, Valerius tells his own story within a narrative frame. In the second fragment of the story, an English lady, Isabel Harley, offers her account of Valerius' stay in Rome. The story opens as Valerius and an English male companion arrive by boat on the promontory of Bauli, the extreme point of Cape Miseno near Naples. As they sit in a shady spot in the Elysian fields, overlooking the Mare Morto in the vicinity of Lake Avernus, a landscape suffused with echoes of Book Six of Virgil's Aeneid, in which Aeneas descends to the underworld, Valerius recounts his strange experiences. While his appearance, we are told, resembles that of the statue of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius on the Capitoline, he claims to have lived rather in the latter years of the Roman Republic, thus in the time of Cicero. Valerius, who'd once held the consulship, met his end, he reports, fighting against the forces of the rebel Catiline in the year 63 BC. The world Valerius now finds himself in, he describes as fallen Italy. He tells of his journey toward Rome some time earlier, how he longed to disbelieve what the priests had told him about the transformation of his country. He was, he says, still obstinately clinging as a mother would to the memory of her lost child, to my loved country, and doubting all that I had heard. Traveling, he imagined himself returned to the Roman Forum, awakening the dead as he calls forth the spirits of Cicero, Cato, Pompey. Still do ye haunt the Forum, awake, arise, welcome me. Newly arrived at evening, Having engaged a local guide, he rushes at once to the forum, the scene of all human greatness, as he describes it, but is appalled at the sight of what it has become, its shattered columns and ruined temples. Instead, Valerius, masking his emotion and temporarily in the role of a particularly ignorant tourist, asks his guide to take him to that immense building whose shadow in the moonshine seems to bespeak something wonderful and magnificent. Valerius is informed that this is the Colosseum. Here, at least, by the light of the moon and amid the weeds and brambles, Valerius experiences what he describes as holy awe. I felt as if, having deserted the camp of Vaccino, this had become the haunt of my noble compatriots. The slippery syntax in that sentence lends agency to the Roman dead. Even the heroic ghosts of the Republic have deserted the forum for the Colosseum. The seal of eternity was on this building, he recalls, and my heart heaved with the overpowering of sensations under which it labored. In this now strange city, dominated by the Catholic Church, Valerius determines to remain amid the ruins of the Colosseum. It is to serve as refuge, a source of reflection, and as vantage point over the rest of the city. It is in the Colosseum alone that I recognize the grandeur of my country. That is the only worthy asylum for an ancient Roman, he insists. Valerius choice of location is distinctly paradoxical. We're explicitly told that he died in 63 BC, 
140 odd years before the construction of the Colosseum itself. The Rome whose loss, Valerius laments, was a republic, not the autocratic imperial state whose victory over the Jews was celebrated under Vespasian and Titus by the construction of the Colosseum. Later, indeed, Isabel Harley, the, um, his English companion, is made to remark, you were happy in dying before the fall of your country and in not witnessing its degradation under the emperors. Valerius, we might note, struggles to find the remains of any buildings associated with the era in which he himself lived. Many Northern European visitors to Rome in the late 18th and early 19th century would similarly deplore the lack of ruins from what was often regarded as the high point of Roman history, the time of Cicero, Lucretius, and Catullus, when Rome was a republic. For Valerius, the Colosseum embodies both Rome's greatness through its majestic beauty and its fall through its ruin. Yet it's also a symbol of Rome's eternity. Um, and Byron's Child Harold is often invoked in this context. Um, stanza 145 channeled inaccurately the venerable bead, um, declaring, while stands the Colosseum, Rome shall stand. When falls the Colosseum, Rome shall fall. And when Rome falls, the world. Mary and Percy Shelley had recently been reading this poem written by their friend. For Mary's Valerius, all of Rome's ruins, of all of Rome's ruins, only the Colosseum can offer a kind of consolation. This characteristic solitude is, I think, a significant factor here. When Valerius first encounters the structure, it is silent, deserted. As he reflects on the greatness of ancient Rome, Valerius insists repeatedly on the total lack of direct human connection between past and present. Indeed, on the subject of modern Italians, both Percy and Mary Shelley are consistently disparaging. In a particularly grumpy mood, Percy wrote of his travels in Italy um, to, in a letter to his friend T.J. Hogg, the filthy modern inhabitants of what ought to be a desert, sacred to the days whose glory is extinguished, thrust themselves before you forever. Mary's reanimated Valerius is made to comment that the wretched Italians who usurp the land once trod by heroes fill me with bitter disdain on the similar terms. They have, he claims, no real connection with the Romans of old. When the Republic died, every ancient Roman family became, by degrees, extinct. Their followers might usurp the name, but were not and are not Romans. The use of usurp in those two passages is striking, I think. Both Percy in his unfinished work, The Colosseum, and Mary in her Valerius explore the possibility that revenant ancient Greeks and Romans may have more in common with educated English visitors than with Rome's current inhabitants. Sitting in the Colosseum, Valerius summons up memories. I remembered, as it were but yesterday, all the shows which ancient Rome had presented, he reflects. Valerius himself, of course, never saw a show in the Colosseum, and it remains unclear whether he refers to the entertainments so often provided for the people of Rome by Roman generals, for instance, to mark a triumph, or whether he refers rather to Roman public life of his own, uh, Roman public life of his own time more generally, as if it were some kind of pageant. Yet the Colosseum, as a site where entertainments were provided, provides an apt setting for such imaginings. Of all the structures remaining from antiquity, the Colosseum provoked, particularly in the 19th century, perhaps the most contradictory responses. In later decades, a necromantic, moralizing reading, in some ways launched by Byron's memorable evocation in another section of Child Harold Canto IV, came to dominate. Visitors insistently conjure forth Byron's brave barbarian gladiator, butchered to make a Roman holiday, and channeling the Capitoline's dying Gaul. Um, they themselves, uh, the visitors thus, play the part of spectators. Charles Dickens, for instance, looking down at the Colosseum in 1846, thinks of the thousands of eager faces staring down into the arena on such a whirl of strife and blood and dust. He apostrophizes, never in its bloodiest prime can the sight of the gigantic Colosseum full and running over with the lustiest life have moved one heart as it must move all who look upon it now. A ruin, God be thanked, a ruin. <laughs> 
Indeed, this kind of response is deliciously satirized by Mark Twain in his 1869 novel, Innocence Abroad, whose narrator roundly declares himself to be the only free white man of mature age since Byron, who has written about the Colosseum without quoting the lines butchered to make a Roman holiday. For many visiting Protestants in particular, the ruin of the Colosseum constitutes the scene of triumph for humanitarian Christianity over a vividly imagined pagan barbarism. But many visitors in the early part of the 19th century focus rather on the majesty of the physical remains themselves. Such reflections flourish especially by night under the moon when any signs of current human life are effaced by darkness and exuberant plant life asserts the potency of nature. Such responses treat the Colosseum not as a portal allowing unmediated access to the, a brutally alien world of Rome, but rather as a figure, especially in its dark, cavernous hollows, for the vast abyss separating the present from the past. Goethe, in Italy in the late 1780s, recalls in 1829 his own last night in Rome. In the solitude of the Via Sacra, the well-known objects seem alien and ghost-like, but when I approach the grand ruins of the Colosseum and look through the gate into the interior, I must frankly confess that a shudder ran through me and I quickly turned home. Antiquity is at once insistently present and intangibly distant. In this sense, the Colosseum resembles the evocative surroundings of the Elysian fields where Valerius relates his story to his companion. Contradictory associations of the Colosseum make it the most appropriate of locales for the psychically dislocated revenant Valerius. Mary Shelley's The Last Man of 1826 is set rather in the distant future. Here she deploys Roman ruin to offer a rather different juxtaposition of past and present, though several aspects of this gargantuan novel echo elements in Valerius. Its lengthy and apocalyptic plot, which found only limited favor with critics and indeed the reading public, involves circuitous journeys across Europe. Britain, and it transpires other countries too, has been devastated by a great plague. The narrator, Lionel Verney, together with his shrinking band of companions, escapes England, but on arriving in Paris, finds it too a desert. They press on to Switzerland and then to Italy, staying for a time near Lake Como, all these spots are equally bereft of inhabitants. When the child Evelyn, Verne's son, dies, the three survivors move on again now to Venice. A plan is hatched to travel to Greece, but a storm brews, and two of the three, Adrian and Clara, drown in a shipwreck, leaving the narrator alone on the Italian shore, the last specimen of humanity. It's, of course, no coincidence that the shipwreck recalls the, the accident by which Percy Shelley met his death some years earlier. Mary herself, having lost her husband and three of her four children, seems to have identified strongly with the novel's protagonist. As she wrote in her journal, the last man, yes, I may well describe the solitary being's feeling, feeling myself as a last relic of a beloved race, my companions extinct before me. But The Last Man also draws on a wide range of literary models, from Defoe's Journey of a Plague Year and Robinson Crusoe to Germaine de Serre's Corinne. Its storyline resonates too with the apoc apocalyptic concerns of a spate of contemporary works, in part prompted, we may imagine, by the environmental impact of 1816, the year without a summer, not to mention the cholera pandemic, which first observed in Calcutta, had ravaged large areas in the east, including much of British India, and penetrated as far as Russia and Syria by 1823. But implicit here too, I would su suggest, is a Volnayan politics of ruin, ruin as warning, ruin as testament. Alone and desperate, Bernie travels on, now by land, toward Rome, the capital of the world, as he terms it. As he reaches his destination, the majestic and eternal survivor of millions of generations of extinct men. He wanders through the city. This is a quotation. I embraced the vast columns of the temple of Jupiter Stator, which survives in the open space that was the forum, and leaning my burning cheek against its cold durability, I tried to lose the sense of present misery and present desertion by recalling to the haunted cell of my brain vivid memories of times gone by. His remembering relates at once to personal time and to historical time. 
Roman ruins have a unique power to recall the dead, not just the dead of antiquity, but the more recently lost also. This repopulating diorama of a vision also conjures up the city's modern inhabitants. Now viewed, we might note, not with the disparagement shown by Mary's earlier character, Valerius, but through the softening lens of romance. Intriguingly, these recent inhabitants include the fictional protagonist of Madame de Stael's Corinne of 1807. This passage from The Last Man echoes a comment made by Isabel Harley, in the earlier Valerius, to Valerius in the earlier story. It seems to me, she says, that if I were overtaken by the greatest of misfortunes, I should be half consoled by the recollection of having dwelt in Rome. Rome can perhaps offer a kind of consolation to the utterly bereft, but it's not a lasting one. Verney continues, I was long wrapped by such ideas, but the soul wearies of a pauseless flight, and stooping from its wheeling circuits round and round this spot, suddenly it fell 10,000 fathom deep into the abyss of the present, into self-knowledge, into tenfold sadness. I roused myself, I cast off my waking dreams, and I, who just now could almost hear the shouts of the Roman throng and was hustled by countless multitudes, now beheld the desert ruins of Rome, sleeping under its own blue sky. The shadows lay tranquilly on the ground. Sheep were grazing untended on the Palatine, and a buffalo stalked down the sacred way that led to the capital. I was alone in the Forum, alone in Rome, alone in the world. What might at first resemble a scene of tranquility, a vision of picturesque ruins with no inconvenient modern Italians to disturb it, every tourist's dream, becomes, for one aware that the quiet is not fleeting, but permanent, and the ruin not just retrospective, but also prospective, the bleakest of sights. There is a troubling echo here of Percy Bysshe Shelley's wish to look upon a Rome unpeopled as he objects to the modern Italians crowding what ought to be a desert sacred to days whose glory is extinguished. In a way, the last man concludes in Rome, for it is here the narrator writes his memoirs before embarking on a plan to set out by boat for wherever the sea may take him. The oscillation of perspective between the soul wheeling in circuits high above and the earthbound misery of the narrator's present in the passage I've just quoted might itself seem an echo of the opening scene of Volney's ruins, but without the reassuring direction provided by Volney's genie. Rome in the last man, its teeming population, vividly but fleetingly imagined by the narrator, now extinct, is nothing but ruins in a desert reduced to the state of Volney's Palmyra. The last man envisages a future post-human world on the brink of a process of decay which will render all cities like the Palmyra of Lyruine. It's a scene with no witnesses, save in prospect, this last man. At the start of the novel, Verney compares himself to um, Romulus, as uncouth a savage as the wolf-bred founder of old Rome, he describes himself. He himself thus encapsulates, uh, thus encapsulates all of Roman history, Roman civilization from foundation to ultimate ruin. <coughs> Indeed, all of human civilization. In Mary Shelley's apocalyptic vision of future ruin, the agent of destruction is environmental catastrophe rather than, as in Volney's scenario, um, political processes over which humans might aspire to exercise some control. We might also contrast her deployment of ruins, particularly Roman ruins, with that of Germaine de Stael, in whose Corinne ruins serve um, as a source of political energy and inspiration for the future, as well as personal consolation. Mary's vision also resonates disturbingly, as we've seen, with the touristic fantasies of Percy and other visitors, influenced, we may suspect, by a Volnian aesthetic in which the full um, effects of ruins can only be savoured in an unpeopled space surrounded by desolation. The ghost of Palmyra, then, informs the, this radically defamiliarised evocation of the ruins of ancient Rome. Thank you.